I wonder if you have ever been in a situation as a parent and you have given your child an assignment or a task. And with that assignment or the task, you've given him or her all the equipping and all the tools, all the motivations, all the encouragement that you thought they needed in order to accomplish this task or the assignment. And within a short period of time, you discover they haven't even begun, let alone finished the assignment. <laughs> Have you been there? I wonder in another situation, if you're an employer, got an employee or a colleague, and you have said to the colleague and assigned him a task or her, and you said, here are all the things you need in order to help you accomplish the task, to accomplish the assignment. All the tools, all the motivations, all the encouragement, all the things they needed, only to discover that they haven't even begun to take that assignment seriously, let alone accomplishing it. I wonder what your reaction would be. I wonder how you feel deep down, whether you verbalize it or not, how you feel deep down. Now, we can speculate on the reasons that they may give. Some probably would say, well, I couldn't do that simply because I got so busy, I didn't get to it. Another excuse is somebody would say, well, look, you know, I thought it wasn't all that important, so I just pushed it aside. I didn't think it was really worth all the effort and the energy that it is required for that assignment to be accomplished. Or somebody might say, well, you know, I, I just felt it was too much for me to do. Somebody must say, you know, I know you've given me all these tools, you've given me all this equipment, to give me all the things I needed, but I still felt very inadequate. I couldn't do it. And then you feel a sense of deep disappointment in your heart. But I want to ask you how you would even feel if you did not ask for that task or assignment to be done once, but you asked twice, three times, four times. You kept on asking, you kept on asking, and the same thing happens over and over again. I wonder the depth of your disappointment. I wonder. When you get all the same excuses, well, it's just I couldn't do it, I was too busy, I was too tired, it was too much, and the rest of it. I wonder how you feel. I think most of us would feel Either that person just did not take us seriously or that person just thought that we did not really, I did not really mean what I just said or, or they probably thought that we are so unfair to give them such a, a task or, some, or, or, or you probably feel that you really are not loved by that person or respected by that person or trusted. In any case, the disappointment is real, the hurt is real, the, the anguish is real, the, the, the feeling of, of being let down is real. And sooner or later, depending on your level of patience and tolerance and perseverance, you're going to act. Sooner or later, you're going to act. Sooner or later, you're going to do something. Sooner or later, you're going to deal with this ignoring of your direction, with this ignoring of the assignment, of this ignoring of this commissioning. Sooner or later, you're going to do something, whatever it is. Now, if you've ever been in that situation, if you've ever been there, certainly you begin to understand the depth of the heart of God. You begin to comprehend just a tiny little bit of God's anguish. For giving His children a commission and repeated it again and again, and yet they ignored it. I wonder if you begin to sense the feeling of God's anguish over His children whom He has commissioned, whom He has sent, whom He has blessed, whom He has equipped, whom He has enriched, and yet they either ignore His commission or they get so busy they forget 
about his commission, or they just could not be bothered with his commission, or they just could not trust in the promises of God to be with them to accomplish this commission. And so they don't do it. They don't do it, whatever the reason may be. But the disappointment on God's part, make no mistake about it, the disappointment on God's part is very real. The hurt on God's part is real. The sorrow on God's part is very real. The, 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 the feeling of being let down is very real. If there is one distinction between biblical faith and all the other religions, it would be this. Listen carefully. Our God is a reaching out God. Our God is a caring God. Our God is a seeking God. Our God is a calling God. Our God is a pursuing God. And yet all the other religions, basically in the very, very essence, man is trying, is striving, is working hard, trying to bribe his God, trying to reach his God, and they cannot. Biblical Christianity is very clear from the very beginning that our God is the one who reaches out to us. Our God is the one who calls us. Our God is the one who pursues us. And from the very beginning, from the be very beginning of history, God chose to use human beings to proclaim His message. God chose human beings to be the agents of reaching out to humanity. God chose flawed human being to be commissioned as his children to make him known. From the very beginning, God chose human instruments to testify to the name of God. I don't know whether you have ever thought about this as I do. I think about this a great deal, particularly when I recognize my own frailty and my own failures and my own weaknesses. And I would say to myself, Lord, if I were God, I would not have given that task to people. <laughs> I mean, if I were God, I would never delegate this most important mission to flawed human beings. But praise God, I'm not God. Amen belongs here. <laughs> this is the way he chose to do it. And I often wonder <laughs> why. But to understand the depth of Jesus' impassion about commissioning his children to be his witnesses in the world, in order to understand this, you must understand the historical account of God's longing desire for his children to be his witnesses, to be a light, to be a soul. To and only then will you really understand how People, his people, disappoint him again and again. You know, most preachers and teachers, when they talk about the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, 18, and I'm going to come to it in a minute, they talk about it as if it is something for preachers and teachers, for evangelists, for missionaries. But it's not true. It's for every one who claimed Jesus as the Savior of his or her soul and the Lord of their life. It's for everyone. Now, I'm going to get to that in a minute. But I thought of a true story that took place right here in the city of Atlanta. They just reminded me sometimes when people talk about the Great Commission and we all Christian, in our Christian huddles, we, we talk Christianese and some people outside really don't understand what we're talking about. I don't know how, many, how many of you know what the Great Commission is? Great Commission. Have you ever heard the term? Well, they have quite a number. These three real estate guys were talking to each other. Now, remember, <laughs> this was at the time when the real estate in Atlanta was at the bottom. I mean, things were really rough. Those of you in real estate remember. Well, those three guys were talking, and two of them were Christians, were people who know the Lord and love the Lord. The other guy is a churchgoer, but he really did not know all the Christian lingo. And they kept talking about the Great Commission, the Great Commission, the Great Commission. And finally, 
This guy who was a church goer but didn't understand what they're talking about finally got so exasperated and I said, now guys, where in the world the Great Commission? I haven't seen one of those in months. <laughs> Now, when Christians talk about the Great Commission, they are referring to Jesus' commissioning of the 500 believers on the Mount of Olive. And His commissioning was that they would multiply themselves by witnessing and making Him known. Let me read that for you, and if you have your Bible with you, turn please to Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Here's what I want to tell you. God's commissioning for His followers did not begin in Matthew 28. This commission that we call the Great Commission did not start in Matthew 28. Do you know where it started? It started in Genesis chapter 12. When God revealed Himself to Abraham, He revealed His plan for the world. You know, it's not a mystery. <laughs> he, he revealed His plan for the world when He revealed Himself to Abraham. What is that plan? Here's what God said to Abraham. Abraham, through you and your descendants, you will be my witnesses in the world that Abraham and his descendants will be the spokesmen and women in the world, that they are to make God known to the people of the nations, that they are to reveal God to the world. And so in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, here's what God said. I will bless those who bless you and whom he curse you, I will curse and the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. That's God's plan. <laughs> In one verse, is God's plan. What did God mean by blessing the nations through Abraham? It's very simple. That the nations are going to hear about the God of Abraham, Jehovah God, from Abraham and his descendants, and they will come to believe in him, and thus they'll be blessed that Abraham and his descendants were commissioned by God to make Yahweh known to the nations. And when the nations come to believe, they'll be blessed. Abraham and his descendants were commissioned by God to be witnesses for God in the world. Abraham and his descendants were commanded by God to tell their neighbors about God and that they would come to believe in Him and thus they'll be blessed. That's God's plan. What it means all it means. But alas, alas, history shows us, history tells us that they failed miserably, that they became inward looking, that they became enamored with themselves, that they were so proud of their association with Yahweh that they would not want the riffraffs in the world to come and share in that knowledge of Yahweh. They kept the message to themselves. They became navel-gazing. And the best example of this inward-looking refusal to obey God's commission is found in the book of Jonah. And throughout Old Testament history, God gave Israel one victory after another. Why? So that they will make Him known. 
Throughout history, God gave them one blessing after another. Why? So that they will make him known. God gave Israel one warning after another. God gave Israel one encouragement after another. God gave Israel one plea after another. God gave Israel one prodding after another. Why? So that they get out of their huddle and make him known. And finally, around the period of 700 years before Christ, you see the God beginning to reveal the rest of His plan to humanity as the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, one after the other, one after the other, began to unfold the plan of God of withdrawing His commission and giving it to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What was it? God is, going to say this, God is going to send from the descendant of Abraham his only begotten son, and he is the one, when he's lifted up, draw all men to himself. And that is why you find that in the very gospel of Matthew, if you read it very carefully, is a dis, the deliberate comparison between Israel, the nation, the Son of God who is disobedient to the commissioning of God compared to Jesus Christ, the obedient Son who is obedient to His Father. But I don't want you to miss this point. If you, if you missed everything I've said so far, please don't miss what I'm going to tell you. Because history repeats itself with precision. It really does. And that is why repeatedly the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to His disciples, spoke to His followers about witnessing and not committing the sin that Israel committed of getting into a huddle and become self-centered and become self-focused. In fact, we know only five times, four in the Gospels, one in the book of Acts, but in reality I have no doubt in my mind that those 50 days between the resurrection and the ascension, the Lord Jesus Christ repeated it over and over and over in their minds so they can get it. Be my witnesses. As, I said, as the Father sent me, I send you. Make disciples of all nations. That the task of witnessing and making Christ known is not relegated to the professional evangelists and preachers and teachers not at all. In fact, if you look at the 500 people that Jesus was commissioning at that time, none of them were professional priests or rabbi. None of them occupied prominent places in the synagogues. None of them who had degrees in philosophy and art. None of them. He said to them, I am going to be with you, and that's enough. That's all the qualifications you need. That's all the equipping you need. That's all the tools you need. Even in church history, we see example after example of how when God's people ignored His commission, God's spirit of witnessing moved on. Even the disciples in the book of Acts who have heard from the lips of Jesus the commission about going out and making the Him known. <laughs> they got into a huddle in Jerusalem, and the book of Acts tells us that God sent persecution so that to force them out and take the gospel out to their neighbors and the neighboring towns. But even Jerusalem, that was the center of witnessing, when they ceased to witness, it ceased to be the center of witnessing. And you see that the center moved to the church of Antioch. And for a while it was the church of Antioch where the center of witnessing was taking place and missionary activities. And when they dropped the ball, as it were, the center of witnessing moved into Alexandria, Egypt. And it was there for 200 years as the center of missionary activities and preaching the gospel and witnessing. And when they cooled their zeal it moved to Rome, and from Rome, it moved to England. And from there, the missionary movement spread, not just throughout the land, but throughout the world, including a ship that came on these shores called the Mayflower. And they came with one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here we are today, 
stand at a crossroads. And God, for this time, allowed us as a nation and as people, his people, to be at the very center of witnessing to the world. I wonder what we're going to do with it. Will we obey his commissioning? Will we open our hearts and our lips and our pocketbooks? Or will we get bogged down in our problems and our concerns and forget about his commissioning to us? You know, I was visualizing as I was fasting and praying and meditating upon the Word of God, and I was visualizing someone from the Church of the Apostles going to heaven. And Jesus said, why did you not obey my commission? Why didn't you do your part? Oh, Lord Jesus, you understand. I had family problems. I have business problems. I had workers' problems. I had this problem and that problem, and I just got so bogged down. And I visualized the Lord Jesus saying, have you not read my word that when you seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, that out of taking care of all your problems? Beloved, I want to tell you, I don't want anybody to face the Lord Jesus in that day with regret. The word is clear. He has commissioned us to be witnesses. I know what some of you probably are thinking, but you know what? I want to tell you this before I, I conclude. Read it in church history. The church that ceases to be a missionary church, soon it will become a mission field. Read it in church history. And I know some of you saying, you're not talking to me. I, I am really just one person, one Christian. What can I do? Uh, you must be talking to the leaders. You must be talking to the teachers. You must be talking to the preachers. No, my beloved, that's the trick of the devil. Don't let him get to you. I'm speaking to every one of you, and I'm speaking to me. Some of you are saying, well, I'm just one person. What can I do? I want to give you two examples. I thought of a dozen, but I'll give you two very quickly because of time, of what one person can do. Andrew, one man, one person. He brought Simon Peter to the Lord. One person. And Simon Peter won 3,000 people to faith in Christ in one day. Ezra Kimball. Ezra Kimball was a layman. He was not still seminary trained. He does not have degrees. He was a layman. He was teaching a class of boys in Sunday school. And he was led of God to lead this particular boy who was a shoe salesman to Christ. One person. He said, what would one person can do? Deal Moody. One thousands of thousands upon thousands of people to Christ. What can one person do? Everything with God's power. One person can be used of God to be the next Spurgeon or Moody or Wesley or Susanna Wesley or Amy Carmichael. Don't underestimate what one person can do under the power of God. Will you be part? Will you be part? Or will you sit back in the seat of salvation and say, somebody else will do it. Somebody else will witness Somebody else will work. Somebody else will invite. Let me plead with you in the witness of the Lord Jesus Christ that before you leave this place, make a decision that you'll participate, that you'll be part of this, and that you'll have the joy of seeing God work in one person. If you'd like to learn how to know God in a personal way, ask for the booklet, Finding the Joy You've Always Wanted. It will tell you of God's love for you and explain how to experience His forgiveness.
you have a personal relationship with God and you're interested in walking closer with Him, the booklet, Seven Steps in Your Faith Adventure, will help guide you into a deeper fellowship with your Heavenly Father. Ask for your free booklet 